So sometimes it's hard to see the outlines because we're right in the middle of it. But America really is in the middle of a profound social upheaval. Nothing is the same as it was a year ago. That's not your imagination. It's really happening. What we're seeing is an actual history-changing revolution in, face, in place of Robespierre's famous liberty, equality, fraternity. Our HR departments have produced their own three-word revolutionary slogan, diversity, equity, inclusion. Now, this is different from what's happened in other countries. Unlike the revolutions in most places, in America, the working class is not the hero of this story. Our working class is the villain. This is not a proletarian revolution. It's a revolution from above. It's aimed straight downward. And you can tell by who's running it. College professors write the radical literature. Politicians put their words into practice. The biggest companies in the world pay for all of it. So maybe not surprisingly, for all their revolutionary fervor, the groups pushing this revolution leave their own power untouched. When you hear people talk about dismantling systems of oppression, they're not talking about themselves. They're talking about you. This is a revolution expressly designed to empower the already powerful. And it's been that way since the first day, since this summer, when George Floyd died in Minneapolis. Now, the first and most obvious question we might have asked at the time, and no one ever asked this, but it's clear, why was a 46-year-old man reduced to passing badly counterfeited $20 bills in a convenience store in the middle of the day? George Floyd was unemployed. Why was he unemployed? How many other people like George Floyd are unemployed and why? Now, that would have been an interesting conversation. It might have been a fruitful conversation for all of us, but we didn't have it, and we didn't have it by design. Instead, we learned a lot about the racial composition of the Minneapolis Police Department. We were told the police there won't, quote, diverse enough, and that was a national emergency. Months later, BLM mobs destroyed the city of Kenosha, Wisconsin, and once again, we were informed that the main problem was a lack of diversity among Kenosha's low-paid cops. Quote, overall, the local Kenosha newspaper announced with what sounded like genuine alarm, the city's police force is 89% white, while the city's population is about 67% white. Okay, Kenosha, too many white hourly workers makes your city burn. That's the message. And as a result of that message, everything changed. But actually, not everything changed. In fact, many things stayed precisely the same. Patterns of residential segregation, for example, they didn't change. They accelerated. Barack Obama's neighborhoods in Washington, Hawaii, and Martha's Vineyard are probably less, quote, diverse than they were a year ago. And that won't change soon because too many people who have a lot of money live there. But most striking of all, now that we're discussing things that haven't changed at all, have been the universities. The overwhelming majority of the ideas behind this revolution come from college campuses. Everything you hear about white privilege and systemic racism began as a lecture about deconstruction in some classroom in the 1990s. And that's why so many BLM activists talk like sociology professors. But most of the actual changes on college campuses have been superficial. Yes, the coursework is very different. Yale no longer even pretends to teach its students anything. It just indoctrinates them. But here's what hasn't changed at all. And this is the key to everything. What hasn't changed at all is the kind of people who go to Yale in the first place. They're rich kids from rich families who plan on staying rich. Not speculation. Here are the numbers. Before COVID, the median family income in the United States was about 65 grand a year. At Yale, it's three times that. The median family income of a Yale University student is 192,000 a year. That's the median. At the University of Pennsylvania, it's about 196,000 a year. At Brown University in Providence, it's 204,000. These are all Ivy League schools with multi-billion dollar endowments, endowments heavily subsidized by you through your tax dollars. So they could afford to educate poor kids, they just choose not to. At Princeton, 72% of students come from families in the top 20% nationally for household income. Nobody seems to have any plans to change any of this. Diversity is for wage earners, not for the people in charge. No one's trying to diversify prestigious campuses because in real life, let's be honest, the lack of diversity is the real reason that people go there in the first place. No one applies to Yale in order to learn things. That's not the point. The point of going to Yale is to cement your position as a credentialed member of America's ruling class. That's the singular purpose of the experience, the only purpose. More than any other standard, more than any award in American society, an Ivy League degree increases the chance that those who hold it in the end will be giving the orders, not taking the orders. That effect is real and it lasts for generations. 
when you go to Yale, your grandkids probably won't have to work construction. So the question is, why should this arrangement continue? And that's a serious question, especially now. If you're going to dismantle systemic power, and we've decided we are going to, you probably shouldn't start with unionized cops in Kenosha. You probably should start with systems that wield actual power. America really does have a class system. They're absolutely right about that. That system is getting more rigid by the day, and we should probably do something about it pretty soon, or the next revolution might not be as peaceful as this one. So here's an idea. Beginning immediately, the top-ranked 50 colleges and universities in America should be prohibited by force of law, if necessary, from accepting students whose parents or grandparents went to college. No more rich kids. Harvard should be reserved exclusively for students who've never experienced the many advantages of living in a ruling class. If you're for diversity, equity, and inclusion, there is no faster way to achieve it than this. So what would happen to Harvard if we did this? Well, it wouldn't be hard for Harvard or any top school to find new students. Millions of college-age kids are itching for the opportunity, and we know who they are. For example, the Biden administration has just announced plans to give amnesty and citizenship to an estimated 30 million foreign nationals now living in the United States illegally. Now, as of right now, you should know this, there is no plan to elevate any of these new Americans into our middle class. No, the plan is to keep them in serfdom at the bottom of the economic ladder. Someone needs to trim our trees and toss our kale salads. That's the view of Democratic donors, and they get their way always. But why should the rest of us accept their plan designed only to benefit them? It's so obviously unfair. Why shouldn't the children of impoverished illegal aliens go to Duke? Cornell, Stanford, Williams, Amherst, Princeton. Why shouldn't they occupy every single bed on every single one of those campuses? But wait a second, you ask, says the Democratic donor. If the Honduran immigrants get into Colombia, who's going to work at the chicken plants? Oh, good question. We nominate the children of New York Times editors. Now, New York Times editors might not like this arrangement very much. They may incite revolution at work. But at the same time, they are fanatically intent on sending their own kids to Yale, and they will do absolutely anything to get them into Yale. They definitely don't want their kids working at chicken plants. They want them working at McKinsey. But the problem is, in a revolutionary moment like this, you can't always get what you want, especially when you're as committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion as your average New York Times editor claims to be. In order to make omelets in this world, you've got to break some eggs. So here's our advice to the members of the woke professional class at The Times and elsewhere who are about to discover that their own rules might actually apply to themselves. Here's our advice. Stop complaining. When you discover that your own children's life plans have been thwarted due to some new imperative of social justice, don't say a word. Don't whine or moan or file a lawsuit. Don't even acknowledge it's happening. Just accept it. It's not like you can pretend you didn't know the meritocracy was fake. You single-handedly destroyed it yourselves. For years, you thought you had an exemption to the rules that you made. You imagined that challenging power applied only to other people's families. Sorry, the revolution has finally come for you. You pictured your kids graduating from the local friend's school and moving on to Cornell to immerse themselves in gender studies and international relations. Oh, but not anymore. It's a new era. Again, an era that you designed. Now your kids will be taking the bus to a poultry processing facility in rural Iowa to begin their new lives serving the critical culinary needs of the people they replace, the ones now going to Cornell. And maybe someday, if they're lucky, your kids can learn to code. But no matter what happens to them over the next several generations, don't fret. And once again, above all, don't complain. Complaining is racist. Diversity is our strength. We're a nation of immigrants. That's the main idea of America, which is you have often told us is simply an idea, not a nation. Now, all of this might be hard for you to see right now. It's painful, and we get it. Because it's happening to you, it might even seem unjust. Trust us, it's not unjust. It's the definition of justice.